I am Russ Littlefield, and I'm currently serving as president of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Lake County. Unitarian Universalism is committed to the health of our environment as the foundation of our personal and social fulfillment. And April just happens to be the month that celebrates the earth. And so I am going to dedicate the lighting of the Unitarian Universalist chalice tonight to the work of creating a healthy environment here in Lake County and around the world. Tonight's topic is beautiful Lake County. Beautiful Lake County. Protecting and enjoying our waterways. In just a moment, we will join our four notable speakers. But first, please give your attention to our tech team chair, Val Rosado, who will tell you how you may use some of the features of Zoom to participate in tonight's program. Well. You need to unmute. Uh, thank you, I just did. Uh, I want, for those of you who are new to Zoom, I just wanted to point out a few things. Please stay muted during the presentation um, until we get to the question and answer period. At that point, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and someone from our tech team will call on you and you can unmute to ask a question. Um, <clears throat> the unmute button is one of the Zoom controls. It says either mute or unmute and it usually has a picture of a little microphone. Everybody's screen is different and sometimes controls appear in different places, but they're usually either at the bottom or on the side or on the top. Um, so you can just look for that. You have two choices of how to view the presentation. If you look for the word view, um, you will have a choice of speaker view or gallery view. In speaker view, the speaker face is prominent. Um, in gallery view, you see all of the people who are attending. Um, <clears throat> you can also ask questions by typing a question into the chat box. Look for the word chat in the Zoom controls. And when you type a question, be sure you press enter at the end because it doesn't, there's no button that says send this in. Um, the enter key on your keyboard is how you do that. Um, we are recording this so you can watch this presentation again later or let your friends know it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, which is UUCLC office. And um, a link to that will also be on our website. Uh, we hope you enjoy the evening. And Thank you, Val. Thank, okay, Russ, I'll turn it back over to you. We are fortunate tonight, as I said, to be able to spend some time with four environmental advocates. I'm going to introduce our first speaker and she will in turn introduce the others. Susan Fetter was recently appointed by the Lake County Commission to the Keep Lake Beautiful Advisory Board. After serving on Lake County Soil and Water Conservation Board, she continues to volunteer with its educational activities. She was one of the leading advocates for Lake County's passage of the fertilizer ordinance. Raised near her parents' fish camp on Lake Griffin, Susan became a, a, a software engineer at Microsoft. She enjoys our beautiful county by hiking, and canoeing along our waterways. Susan? Hello, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, 
I will introduce other speakers as we go along. Um, I was going to kick off this presentation talking about something that isn't exactly in Lake County, but it affects our environment and our watershed fairly directly. So I'm going to start this PowerPoint and share my screen. Okay, so does everybody see the free the Ocklawaha slide? Yes. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, so if you've been up to Silver Springs and been a little bit north of here, you've encountered a lot of our natural environment of the Ocklawaha River. And if you were at Silver Springs several years ago, maybe even in the early 80s, you probably noticed that the springs were teeming, teeming with, with thousands of fish. Well, the springs are still beautiful, but there's not so many fish there and there's not so many manatees. So it, it turns out that this has been a tourist attraction for Central Florida since at least about 1890. There was a time period called the steamboat era uh, that lasted from about 1873 until about 1930, where folks would come from all over the country and come in either to Jacksonville or Palatka and hop on these narrow river steamboats and view the beautiful forest and waterways and wildlife, and they'd end up at Silver Springs. And sometimes they'd come even further south. The... Um, It, the, some of the lines came all the way into Leesburg because as you may already know, the Ocklawaha River, the mouth of the Ocklawaha River or the source of the Ocklawaha River is on the north end of Lake Griffin. And so they would come all the way down the Ocklawaha River from Palatka and many of them came into Leesburg or once in a while you'll see a reference to Eustis in some of the history and documentation. But mostly they went into Silver Springs. So after the era of the steamboat, the railroads kind of took over from the steamboats and but people were still coming to Silver Springs until the powers that be decided that driving cargo all the way around the state of Florida was expensive and lengthy and decided that we needed to have a barge canal to cross all the way across the state of Florida from Jacksonville down the St. Johns River across the center of the state in Putnam County and then they were going to dig a big ditch all the way across through Ocala and out into the Gulf of Mexico over there near Dinellon and this started out as a major, it was a major construction project. They started right in the center by building this Rodman Dam. And the Rodman Dam area is um, a great big basin designed to hold cargo ships as they traverse the lakes or traverse the state and go into Florida. And as you can see, there's a whole film about this that I will um, give you a link to at the end that shows you what they did in the early 60s when they started construction by killing many, many trees and um, channelizing the main course of the river. And they ended up with this. This is the, um, the Rodman Dam and Kirkpa Kirkpatrick Dam and Rodman Reservoir named after heroes of the fishing industry. But what this has done is this has made this very large stagnant pool of water with actually no purpose because in 1971, they canceled the Cross Florida Barge Canal project and left this in place. In the meantime, local people decided that this was a great place to go fishing and a great destination for sports people. But it turns out that the water is kind of stagnant and it gets very choked up with weeds and it's hard to access. And the um, also blocks migration. So all the fish that used to come in and out of Silver Springs and the manatees that used to come in and out of Silver Springs, they can't get past the structure. So the wildlife and the aquatic life is completely impaired because of the structure and has been since it was built in the 60s. Uh, there's a group of people who have come together to advocate for removing this, this dam. And one thing that you'll notice is that every few years they have to draw down the dam. They have to open up the dam and let the water flow into the reservoir or out of the reservoir so that the weeds are removed. And it helps the weeds, um, the weeds get out of the area. And you, what you'll see when this happens is you will see all the beautiful springs in the Ocklawaha River and you will see the forest that was killed and drowned in order to create this fishing basin. So they call this the, the lost springs of the Ocklawaha. If you've ever been to Rainbow River, where you can kayak down the river and see a spring every once in a while, this is what the Ocklawaha should look like. It should look a lot more like the Rainbow River, 
but all the water that's held in the reservoir backs up and puts pressure on the springs and the water can't come out of the springs nearly as much. So they have also determined that the dam is at the end of its life cycle. The dam is, depending on who you talk to, very likely to fail anytime in the near future. It is got some maintenance problems. It, it's very expensive to run. It's also, there's a big political battle going on about the land that it's on. It is, um, has, there's a lease um, between various environmental agencies and landholders in the state and the lease is expired. And so it's kind of even being operated on uh, an expired lease and expensive to maintain and all of this for no real purpose or certainly not its original intended purpose. So the state environmental Dep protection department has already agreed that the reservoir and the, the dam should be removed and the reservoir restored to its natural flow. They have a plan. It is approved by the environmental scientist of the state. They've got an idea to make sure that the, the, the spillway is removed, the um, adjoining creeks are restored, and the river flow is returned to a more natural course. And on top of that, the University of Florida has done a number of studies and projects proving that the ecotourism opportunities that would become of this, the kayaking, the bird watching, the, even the fishing will be retained, uh, will all be a much better economic engine for our area than the current fishing industry too, because you're adding on a very strong ecotourism piece. These are, there's a, I'll give you this reference to this website. This is the University of Florida. One of the professors there assigned its student, their students, marketing students projects to design what, what we could have. What, in, what will we have if the river was restored? We'd have these kayaking opportunities. We'd have a lot of history. There's a lot of history around just the steamboats themselves coming. Bartram, who's a famous Florida explorer, um, went down the Ocklawaha River. That's where he came into Florida, was through this Ocklawaha River path. There was a lot of native settlers in the area and there some Indian mounds were even plowed through to create this impoundment. So there would be a lot of history available to us of native cultures. There, there could be a paddling trail. The paddling trail would start in Lake County, in the south part of Lake County, and you could paddle all the way from the Harris chain of lakes up the Ocklawaha, um, all the way through Putnam County and out to the St. John's on a very, um, the Great Florida Riverway paddling trail. And there's be a wildlife corridor created. There's all pluses. Every single one of these things includes economic benefits to our state if this broken and ill-conceived dam was removed. I do have a pretty strong opinion about this <laughs> in case you were wondering. So I have a list of resources that if you'd like to learn more about the uh, Free the Ocklawaha, the first of all, the freetheocklawaha.com website is sort of your one-stop shopping. Everything you need to know about this project is here on the site. You, you'll find out about the groups that are active in, the, in advocating for the dam removal and the river restoration. You'll find out what's happened so far. There's lawsuits. There's a couple different lawsuits involved. There's a lot of, of um, discussions amongst various political entities. The Putnam County Commission in particular is very much against removing the the dam, but then many, many environmental groups, including the um, boat captain that we saw earlier in the slides, are very vocal about getting this riverway back to its more natural state. Could you imagine going to Silver Springs and having it look a little bit like Blue Springs, full of manatees and full of fish? It would be just really amazing to have that so close to Lake County. The best two things that you can do are number one and number two on this list. And I'll put this document in the chat window where you can download it. The, the best things you can do is watch this film, The Lost Springs, and then a slightly older one, This River Be Damned. And The, the Lost Springs is a very recent take on what's going on. It talks about the political activities that are going on and, and the uh, gives you some really beautiful video of what the area looks like in the drawdown state, which gives you an idea of what you're going to see once the dam is re removed and the river restored. The River Be Damned is a little bit older, but it really does a good, a good job of showing the history of how this became and the destruction. The It gets very graphic explosions and um, 
construction shots that will show you just how much damage they did just installing the thing. There's a lot of history along the river, like I mentioned, and there's a really good list of cultural history sites and abilities that you'll be able to see if the river's restored. And then also the University of Florida for number four there gives a lot of resources about the economic benefits. And the best thing that you can do is join the mailing list at the freetheaklawaha.com website. And there's a link there on that website that you can write to the governor. The biggest thing blocking this project right now is the governor needs to approve the funding and advocate for the legislature to allocate the funding to do this pro project. It's really important to remember that this is already approved all the way up the chain for all environmental groups and state environmental agencies. It's just a matter of convincing the political entities that this needs to be funded. The Free the Aklawa folks have a great Facebook page. And then at the bottom of this document and also on the website, there is a lot of organizations working together. It's quite an amazing group effort to support the building of this great Florida Riverway to get the Oklawaha system healthy again so it can join into the St. Johns River and contribute to the healthy environment in the St. Johns River Basin as well. So there's many groups that are doing that. There's the Sierra Club, there's the Save the Manatee Club, um, there's the Florida Springs Institute, 1,000 Friends of Florida. There's a very long list of, of organizations that are supporting this Free the Oklawaha effort. And one other thing you can do is just even a, like a $5 a month or a small contribution to any of these organizations that are all working very closely together is something else that you can do if you'd like to help get our riverways restored. So that's my thing about the Free the Oklawaha. There's way more information here uh, that I couldn't cover in a short meeting like this. And I encourage you to go into any of these resources and learn more. So uh, next we're gonna hear from Dr. Beverly Ward. And Dr. Ward is, goes by Beverly. She's an anthropologist and former University of South Florida faculty mentor. She's provided technical assistance to communities and government agencies on environmental and social justice. She's active in environmental committees for the local NAACP and the Southeast region of the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers. She enjoys living in Util Umatilla in the Oklahoma River watershed. Beverly, welcome. You need to understand. Thank you. I, <laughs> you got it. Thank you, everyone, um, uh, for having me here and um, in beautiful Umatilla and beautiful Lake County. I want to um, trouble you a little bit uh, this evening and to talk about the social impacts of water quality. And I'll, I'll share some insights that I have with you. And this is a. Um, <clears throat> piece that is in motion always. Um, so, um, most of my work has to do with transboundary uh, conditions such as water or air quality, but I'm going to focus tonight both basically on air quality and issues around climate justice. Um, probably everyone here is familiar with the term environmental justice and a lot of work has grown out of um, some efforts by uh, by religious organizations for sure there's a, a number of pe uh, resources that I'll share with you later um, but basically when we talk about em environmental justice we mean equal protection from environmental and health hazards and meaningful public participation and decisions that affect the environment in which people live, work, play, and pray. And so when we compound climate degradation uh, with uh, these environmental hazards, there can be, uh, these hazards can be exacerbated. Um, tonight, I'm gonna to share with you some, some, some concepts around uh, climate gentrification. And basically when we talk about gentrification, we, we tend to think of the older or inner cities, urbanized areas where building stock is repurposed for new uses. But what we're facing now with climate gentrification is formerly locally undesirable land uses or LULUs for the planners among us that are redeveloped or purposed uh, to withstand climate change. 
And it can lead to real estate speculation and other anthropogenic actions that displace existing communities or uh, previously unused land. Um, and so what happens with this is, uh, as David Capelli said, resiliency becomes coded as a way to do land grabs. So um, this is part of uh, another water issue that we have going on. And if we look at, uh, this is from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, and their sea level rise viewer, with a cons what we now know of to be a rather conservative estimate of sea level rise at six feet, uh, we're inundated in Florida, and it's basically the spine, uh, pretty much, you know, where we are in Lake County that, that becomes uh, a safe haven. And I'm going to give you another, we zoom into Lake County, you can see it better. And what's, what hasn't been uh, studied as much is what happens to some of the inland waterways, but there's enough pressure already if we just look at what's happening with the coastal, uh, people on the coast are beginning to move inland. And that's already happening here in Florida. So uh, this is a very busy slide. As you get to know me better, you will, you will know that I like to do these because it's my way of drilling down to what's going on on the local level. And I've, I've done this to get to all of the census de designated places or, or city equivalents that are, have populations greater than 5,000. And that's that first column that you see there. I'm only gonna highlight um, four or five areas here. The population change in Lake County it, it has been estimated to be growing faster than the U.S., Florida, uh, and within those um, the, the areas in Lake County that have populations over 5,000, together they are growing more, more rapidly than the county overall. Um, the next slide to look, uh, next uh, key statistic that I want you to look at is the population of persons who are age 65 years and older. Um, Lake County tends to be older than the US uh, and Florida, but those, those uh, more urbanized areas or more densely populated areas are slightly younger, but it's still pretty high. Um, also, we look at the, the people of color uh, population. Uh, Florida, it, on average, is greater than the rest of the U.S. Lake County is uh, uh, has a is less uh, racially and ethnically ethnically um, diverse than the rest of Florida. However, those numbers are high. Overall, there is a l pretty large percentage of veterans also in Lake County, and then <clears throat> next to the last, persons with disabilities. It's, um, per, uh, it's higher in Lake County than Florida in the U.S. And then uh, the poverty level, uh, persons, uh, the percentage of persons is higher. So when we look at uh, what we call environmental justice communities, these are some of the characteristics that we look at. And what we find is that the benefits and burdens of uh, different decisions are not equitably distributed. And that's why we look at different characteristics uh, within uh, areas. So uh, one of the things I always do is go to the uh, environmental justice, the Environmental Protection Agency has an environmental justice screening tool. And they look at, uh, they don't look as many uh, demographic indicators as I do, but you will see some of the same indicators that I suggested, uh, that I, I had in my list. And so um, these are important to think about how these benefits and burdens of, affect us. Um, and the, within the environmental justice screener, they look at um, 11 environmental indicators to, look at, to compare to the quality of um, thing. Now, most of these indicators uh, to your left have to do with air quality, but I draw your attention to Superfund proximity. This is where, how closely people live to Superfund sites. That's where something has been done that may have buried, uh, uh, a good example is, um, you know, uh, places uh, that have buried, like uh, that have maybe produced batteries. So the that may be a super fun site where uh, uh, chemicals may be leaking into the aquifer. Uh, this is proximity to uh, risk, other risk. Uh, that's what RPM stand for. 
and then hazardous waste proximity again. Uh, so on all three of these indicators, um, Lake County uh, compares um, is lower than the state percentile, lower than the regional percentile, and lower uh, than the U.S. Uh, percentile. However, and, and all of these except for um, the RPM proximity are below 50%. However, when we looked at wastewater discharge indicators, uh, Lake County is higher than both uh, than the state, the region, and the U.S. percentile, which taught, which gives us some indication of people who live near water, that streams, uh, water bodies or whatever, their water tends to be, have more pollutants in Lake County. That's what this slide, this um, indicator is telling us. And again, I've been drilling, I've been looking at this data and looking at those um, 14, uh, no, 10 uh, areas in Lake County that have populations concentrations that are greater than 5,000. And I have some other uh, data that I can, will be happy to share with you later, but I only have five minutes. So I just want to, I want you to ask me back. So I, I can't give you everything at once, but I do want, want you to uh, concentrate on that. So we'll be, do, I'll be as other, uh, the other presenters follow up. When we think about water quality and the water quality in Lake County, place humans and where we live in Lake County and uh, in, into this context. And, and when we talk about the benefits and burdens, this is my contact information. And I want you to know that the photographs that I share with you were taken by me in Lake County. Thank you. And I'll pass it back to Susan. Beverly, thank you so much for that data. I think that probably a lot of folks don't look at that kind of thing very often, and it's very illuminating to know that even this data exists and what we can think about when we're trying to influence policymaking or um, actions in our environment. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Marianne Krisovich. Marianne is a member of the Lake County Soil and Water Conservation District Board, and she's the executive director of the Florida Lake Management Society. She's a certified erosion and sedimentation control inspector and has over 20 years of experience working with students, volunteers, and local governments in Lake County on water quality issues. Uh, Marianne's been a good friend, and she was there with us in the fertilizer ordinance battle, and she has a lot of information about that to share with us. So Marianne, thank you. Well, thank you, Susan. It is an honor to be here with a, such a group of such knowledgeable women. So thank you all for sharing your expertise. And today I'm just going to touch a little bit on Blake County's fertilizer ordinances and what that means to the citizens here in Lake County. And first of all, I think it's important to know why we do need ordinances uh, and this is number one reason why. This is an algal bloom in a local pond. I took this picture um, just a, a few years ago. This is actually an older picture. This is not Lake Mineola. Um, however, we do have pictures that are very similar uh, to that, what you're seeing here on the screen. But the um, fertilizer ordinance is important to us because it does help guide not only our fertilizer companies, but our applicators and our citizens to help to protect our water resources. So who does the Lake County ordinance apply to? And this ordinance applies to anyone who lives in unincorporated Lake County. If you live within city limits, then you are under the jurisdiction of the fertilizer ordinance that has been adopted by your city officials. We are currently working with a lot of cities throughout the county to continue to upgrade their fertilizer ordinances to meet or exceed what has been adopted by Lake County. So Lake County actually adopted their ordinance all the way back in 2017. And um, that is now known as ordinance number 2017-17. And it was required for every community that was part of a Springs base, Basin Management Action Plan uh, was required to actually adopt an, ordin an ordinance. So they're now complying with this Florida Springs and Aquifer Protection Act um, in the state of Florida. The original ordinance was adopted in, adopted in April of 2017. 
And the Keep Lake Beautiful Committee actually adds uh, some revisions to it. And the revised ordinance was adopted on November 21st, 2017. And the county commissioners gave the citizens of Lake Unincorporated Lake County one year of kind of a free pass to uh, where if you were caught doing something in violation of the ordinance, you would not get a fine. You had that one year grace period, but that grace period has now expired. And just so you know, the picture that you're looking at there is from Alexander Springs. That is the only first magnitude spring that we have here in Lake County. Now the fertilizer ordinances, um, the main four main points of that I've listed on the screen. Uh, you are not permitted to use a fertilizer with nitrogen or phosphorus between June and September 30th of each year. So that's coming up pretty quickly. And the reason for that is that is because that is our heavy rainfall time of year. So the less runoff we have from fertilizer, the more uh, healthier our lakes will be. You also cannot apply fertilizer within 50 feet of the shoreline, or I'm sorry, 15 feet in, um, of the shoreline. They also recommend that you have an additional 15 feet of non-application, uh, non non-maintenance as an additional buffer. You also, uh, during the off times of October 1st through May 1st, you can use a fertilizer containing nitrogen or phosphorus, but it must be at least 50% or more slow release nitrogen. And how do you know if that's the case? It'll say that on the label. Um, we do need to read our fertilizer labels. Uh, the label is the law, so please make sure when you buy your fertilizer, you are reading it uh, and following that label. Uh, it'll say either slow release or water soluble, slowly avail available or organically available. And that just allows the plants time to take up the uh, nutrients and not let it sit there on the ground. Um, like I like to teach my students uh, in class that uh, plants are just like people. At Thanksgiving time, you put too much on your plate, you can't eat it all, but we can wrap up our food and put it in the refrigerator and save it for later. Plants do not have a refrigerator, so whatever food they cannot use at the time, they have to leave right there on the ground. And if it rains before they're ready to uptake more of those nutrients, it's just going to wash away. So um, don't overfeed yourself at Thanksgiving and don't overfeed your yard throughout the year. And the other thing that the ordinance requires is overspray. So if you're using one of the um, pellet type of fertilizers, you do need to clean that, sweep that back up off of your hard surfaces. Please don't get your hose out and wash it down. That defeats the purpose. We just need you to sweep or blow it back onto your yard. So why are they focusing on nitrogen and phosphorus? Oops, go back to that. Um, nitrogen and phosphorus are the two nutrients that are most impactful in our waterways in great amounts. These are the nutrients that, that really um, cause an intense algal bloom uh, and other uh, environmental impacts. So that's why we focus on, you'll hear us talking about those two many times. By the way, that is Lake Kirkland down in South Claremont off of 561. And I mentioned before um, a fertilizer free zone that 15 feet required in the buffer. Um, the backyard that you see here is nice and green and lush and gets absolutely no fertilizer whatsoever. Not just because I am lazy and don't want a fertilizer or my husband is cheap and doesn't want to buy the fertilizer, but it's because we want to maintain that lake um, to the best of our ability. So we don't see any reason to um, use fertilizer in our backyard. So what happens if you use too much fertilizer? Like I said, the label is the law. Make sure you are applying your fertilizer at the proper amounts. If it says use um, two pounds of fertilizer for your size lawn, four times is not twice as good. Four times, anything more than what's on the label, can uh, 
cause your lawn to die, your plants to die, which here you are trying to help them and now you've killed them. Uh, and also, as I mentioned before, that excess will run off into our lakes and rivers and streams. Now, the plants on those shoreline are the last line of defense between you and me and that lake. The plants are going to absorb any of those excess nutrients. They're gonna slow down the water that's flowing off of your shoreline into our bodies of water and they are providing habitat. So if you live on a shoreline, please do not remove your plants from your shoreline. Uh, I know you might be afraid of snakes or alligators, but remember that's their home. Your home is up, in the, uh, up the hill a little bit. So leave your plants there. And what you see here are some nice native plants, the little purple spikes that you see the arrow shape, that's pickerweed. Um, closer to the front, just above the word last in my picture, you'll see the little white flowers. Those are um, duck potato. So great native vegetation. Just be sure you um, follow the instructions in your area. And one last but very important thing, unrelated to the fertilizer ordinance, but back on what Susan mentioned, um, for those of you who do, do not know, um, but maybe you do boat in the Harris Chain of Lakes, we do have manatees in the Harris Chain of Lakes. So when you are boating, especially when you are along the shoreline or at the boat ramp, please check your prop before you start it up and post somebody at the front to keep an eye out for these little guys. And if you, oh, well, little, they're okay, they're big old fat potatoes. But um, if you do see them, please contact FWC immediately. Um, you can just dial them up at pound FWC on your cell phone. That's the wildlife hotline um, because we do have researchers who are studying the reason why they're making their way back down the Okawaha to visit us here for the first time ever in Lake County. Thanks everybody for giving me a few minutes here. Well, thank you, Marianne. That was very interesting. And I, I think that your first picture is one of the things that's really going to drive this home for everybody. If you don't want big clumps of nasty overgrowing algae in your in your backyard lake or where you're going jet skiing, don't put too much fertilizer on your lawn. So um, thank you very much, Marianne. I noticed that some folks have been putting some questions in the chat window and we will, after Peggy speaks and all four of us are available to answer, we will address those. So if you have questions that come up as people are talking, please type them in the chat window. We will get to those in a few minutes. Our next speaker is Peggy Cox and Peggy has lived in South Lake County and advocated for better planning and protection of local and natural water resources for the last 24 years. She was elected twice to the Lake County Water Authority Board. She served as a board member and president of the Alliance to Protect Water Resources, which was active for many years in Lake County. Peggy's just one of our best all around go to people for water resource and environmental issues and so and Peggy's another one of my really good friends so Peggy thank you so much for joining us can and let's hear what you have to say about our chain of lakes thank you very much I appreciate um, the uh, introduction um, I need to find out how to get some of the things I submitted up on my screen um, I, I believe our UU Tech team is taking care of that. If you can okay, just there we go. There you go. That's all right. I'm going to. The uh, subject of the evening was about how we can keep Lake County and our lake system beautiful. How we can um, get along with uh, nature and and keep things beautiful. And I have to tell you that uh, I find. Um, a lot of misconceptions just about the chain of lakes, both of them. This is a folded out version of, um, whether I can slide this over, no, that's okay. Of the two chains of lakes that the um, Lake County Water Authority put out about 12 years ago. And I, I um, feel that it's one of the, simplest explanations of how the chain of lakes works. The Claremont chain of lakes, which is, I can't see because of the pictures of everybody are over it, but the Claremont chain of lakes starts in the green swamp. And the green swamp is the heart of the Florida aquifer. 
and it is it is fed rain. The green swamp is part of the green swamp area of critical state concern, 107,000 plus acres in South Lake County, more than that in Polk County. And uh, this is an area that was decided in the 1970s because it is the center of the aquifer for all of Florida north of the Everglades aquifer. So it's very important. And coming out of the Claremont chain as the with Wicucci chain, as uh, St. John's, everything flows north. And as you can see on your, uh, if you have the Green Swamp, the Claremont chain of lakes, you can see the different lakes. And I know this is simple, but apparently it's easier to explain to people. They can see one lake joins another lake, stormwater comes in, water evaporates from the top of the lakes, but these lakes in the Claremont chain have seepage into the aquifer, approximately 13 inches a year on a year of uh, regular uh, rain of at least 50 inches. So that's how we, now the aquifer continues to drop due to population increases and other things, but the Claremont chain of lakes flows this way. When you get to the north end of it, if, well, I can't open this up. Um, you go out of Lake Mineola into the Platlakaha River Basin, which flows all the way to Lake Harris. And if you look on this page down at the very bottom, you can see how the Platlakaha River in bits and pieces comes northward and flows into Lake Harris in the southwestern corner. And in Lake Harris, which then is the largest lake in the Harris chain of lakes, it flows north into what's called the super pond. The super pond comes from Lake Apopka. It's Lake Dora, Lake Carlton, Lake Beauclair, um, and Lake Eustis. Lake Harris flows into it. Lake Apopka has one of the only um, I shouldn't say that. Lake Harris has springs along the south side. There are no springs in the Claremont chain of lakes. There are no springs in the Claremont chain. We have seepage, we have rainfall. We have lots of um, what's called um, recharge areas on either side of the defined lakes, which expel water northward into this flow going north. When you get into the Harris chain, as you can tell, can go all the way up to the Ocklawaha River. Lake Harris flows into Lake Eustis through Dead River. Lake Dora goes through the Dora Canal into Lake Eustis. And then we go down Haynes Creek into Lake Griffin. I do not believe Lake Yale is uh, connected anymore other than through the marsh to the chain of lakes. All of this uh, lake Apopka on the lake side, on the county of Lake, in the southwestern corner has Gordneck Springs, which discharges into Lake Apopka. So you can tell not much of Lake Apopka is in Lake County. These two chains of lake are what we're trying to keep clean. We're trying to make them, um, well, we've already done that. We've made them attractive to people. So for those of you who live in South Lake County, like I do, which has a huge population uh, increase, uh, we're pretty much maxed out as far as recreation on the chain of lakes on most weekends. Not, not today, by the way, but unless you want to be hit by lightning. But other than that, um, this is it. The water levels are regulated in the Claremont chain by the Lake County Water Authority to Cherry Lake and Villa City dams, and they're going to be automated soon. These were established many years ago when Claremont was surrounded by citrus groves and agriculture. And they were put in place to try and keep water in the chain because they would keep the surrounding air warmer for the, when the winters were cold. Uh, since we have very little citrus left, um, the chain of lakes has a sort of a different 
uh, purpose. And it's mainly for enjoyment of the people who live here and to help people uh, and to, to provide for uh, recreation and to use that water for fishing, to provide for the animals that need it and to keep it clean. This is an ongoing effort. And I have come to the conclusion that in order to keep our lakes beautiful, to keep them desirable for people to come and recreate there for the, I, I am an Audubon person, I'm a bird watcher. The bird population in both of these chains of lake is wonderful. And we want to keep it that way. We want to keep the areas, the natural areas that the birds and um, other wildlife need. And in order to do that, we have got to come to a, uh, an agreement about what we can and cannot put into the chain of lakes. The fertilizer ordinance is a perfect example. I'm even further, uh, the, the, the 15, the 10 feet, the 20 feet, 15 feet dead zone that you should have, and I hate to use the word dead, uh, fertilizer free zone you should have between where your water or your lawn ends, whether it's the street, the water, whatever, because things run off your lawn into the street and then they go into a stormwater system. We don't have enough stormwater systems in Lake County. The Water Authority provides um, grants to different cities and they've been taken advantage of, um, but it is not enough. We have the city, I'll give you an example, the city of Mineola. The old city of Mineola, which is on the Eastern shore of Lake Mineola. Whoops, we all, we'll get to this in a minute. <laughs> and um, is, um, has a, a main street and then it has a lakeshore drive on the Eastern shore of Mineola. There's no stormwater system there at all. Anything that rolls off all those beautiful lawns and landscaping on the houses that are on that Eastern shore, on that Lakeshore Drive, the old Lakeshore Drive uh, along the Eastern shore, everything just runs into the lake because Mineola is not in a position to, they have new approved, that were approved years ago that are now being built. The hills of Mineola is their, um, problem. They have to deal with that. And it has to be built to modern and current specifications, which are different than they were 30 years ago. So their effort, their tax money, everything is going that way. And to try and make improvements on their existing systems, they're, they're without an ability to do that right now. And that has happened to a lot of the smaller cities and towns in Lake County, not in unincorporated Lake County, but inside their city limits. And so I think we have to do our best, and I, I don't wanna use the word politics, but we have to talk to people who are running for offices about how important this is because the chain of lakes, both of them are great revenue drawers. So people who come here, a few weeks ago, and Marianne knows this, and I don't know exactly how long ago it was, but was a huge bass fishing tournament in the Harris Chain of Lakes. 400 and something plus boats registered and went out bass fishing. These people bring a lot of money that goes into our revenue coffers for food, drinks, gasoline, staying overnight, whatever. And we, we almost have, Marianne can correct me if I'm wrong, but through Hickory Point and a few other water authority um, areas where the water authority helps on different dams, there is a bass fishing tournament most every single weekend on the Harris chain of lakes. That's important, we need that. But in order to keep them coming back, we need to make sure the water is clean, the shorelines function as they should, that we have a, a thriving chain of lakes. Um, and that also, into the, uh, and that's one of my pet peeves that we need to focus on what we can do environmentally to keep pollutants out of the lakes, to keep people 
recreating in a safe way and in a responsible way, we need to do that. Um, Lake County has over 1,400 named lakes. And they depend on the Florida aquifer and that water. That's another, that's a whole nother conversation. But we have, that's why we're named Lake County, in case anyone didn't figure that one out just yet. Um, we're named Lake County because we have so many lakes long ago. We have two, we have some very um, in, uh, informative and um, I've lost track of my words here, but informative and good um, sources to use for information. They're called water atlases. The Lake County Water Atlas is administered through the Lake County Water Authority. But Lake County isn't the only county with a water atlas. Almost all of Central Florida counties have a water atlas. Water atlases have more intense. You can go on there, whatever lake you live on, you can find your lake, you can click on it. It will tell you everything you ever wanted to know or didn't want to know about this lake. And if it's being regularly tested for different things, or if it's been treated for different things, water atlases are available for everyone. There's one there. They are um, run by the University of South Florida Water Institute. And they partner with, and Mariana Stunt, thank you, has done this. And uh, Orange County has one, Seminole County has a water atlas. I don't know how many there are, but I would say at least half the counties in the state are part of the water atlas system. So if you need any information about your lake, and it doesn't matter whether it's on one of these, so you, see, you can see on your screen now a picture of why we're called Lake County. You see all of that water in little lakes, big lakes, small lakes, large lakes, um, yeah, it's just, there's just a lot of water in Lake County and it's really beautiful water and we need to keep it that way. One of the ways that we can keep it, and I'm gonna ask Henry or somebody who ever has my septic tank pictures, there are two different ones. Um, one of the ways we could do that is to try and work on getting almost everyone connected to major wastewater sewage treatment plants instead of septic tanks. Now, I grew up on a farm. I was raised in the country. I've lived on acreage more than half my adult life. I want you to see this picture. This came out of the water atlas, actually, a water atlas. This is a picture of Lake County wastewater. And over here on the right, you can see the sewer is the, 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 the way they pick colors is pretty awful. The sewers were brown and yellow where they are. And over here is green for septic cysts. This is Lake County. Whoops. Uh, this is Highway 27. Here's 41. All of these green dots and spaces represent an approved septic system that was put in place. All you have to do is look at that and see how many houses, and they're not rural, just rural houses. Housing developments in so many areas are on septic tank, at least two to an acre, sometimes three. Last place I lived, which was the subdivision we all had septic tanks. The septic tanks were not big enough to handle what need, what the average household puts out is wastewater. Over here on the left side, I'll see if I can move this over. You can see that septic systems, thank you, are mainly in established urban areas. This is the city of Claremont. This is where there are septic systems around high density, development. The same way you look up here on 441 and you see around Mount Dora, Eustis, and those areas. 
where there, and thank goodness, there are a lot of that's commercial because uh, very few commercial buildings want to be involved in dealing with septic systems. All the information you need to know about on-site sewage treatment disposal systems, OSTS, is the Department of Health. You can Lake County's Department of Health, click on environmental health, and you will see um, large lists of how many permits were issued, which ones were uh, recalled, which ones are dormant. There's a, a, a huge amount of information. It's all done through the Department of Health. And to Nancy's um, comment, Nancy Hurlbut's comment, which I saw come up, it's, it's the one thing that we're gonna have to, in my opinion, and some other people who uh, may, maybe be considered somewhat over the top, but we have got to get a handle on on being able to deal with wastewater sewage and wastewater treatment. Because it's done now, it, uh, the, the um, Henry or, or someone, if we have that picture of how a septic system actually looks underground, if you can find that and put it up, I'll try and explain it. Um, septic systems work if you have a large enough drain field, if they're maintained, if the septic tanks are pumped out every three to five years and the sludge that has gone to the bottom is taken away, there are, there are companies that deal with the sludge, whether it goes in, uh, and, and that's this is even worse. Now there was another picture of, there it is, thank you. This shows you how a septic tank actually works. It's hooked inside of the house to the plumbing system, to the toilets, to the dishwasher, to the washing machine, the sinks, and the septic tank is here. And all of the water that you flush and, and run out of your house to the septic tank, the heavier solids sink to the bottom. Now, this was a picture uh, that I found on the internet uh, from an engineering firm trying to um, show how this actual septic tank with additional treatment would be a good thing because it would remove more nitrogen from the sludge that was going into the drain field, which then pushed into the soil. I don't know whether how that worked out, but the septic tank itself then sends the liquid that is left after the solids sink to the bottom out into a drain field. Um, and there are certain um, size requirements. Um, they're about a foot underground. The, they're uh, piped and graveled and things the, that the solid, that the uh, can slowly trickle through and lose and uh, get absorbed into the soil. Um, unfortunately, um, it impacts the soil sometimes, especially if the drain field is not large enough, if the septic tank is not large enough, if your family is overwhelming you. There are almost every, that I can think of in recent years, new subdivisions within some of the small cities that are on septic tank. And those in the county are almost always, because the county has no solid waste disposal facilities, not in Lake County. They're not in that business. Um, I think they need to be. And I think this is part of the way we're going to have to think of, these are the two things to me and the septic system issue is, needs to be addressed. Will it cost more money? Yes, it will. However, when you deal with um, revenue sources, the money that we re receive through our tourism, through our lake activities, the fishing activities, if that begins to drop off because people, because the lakes become polluted or it's harder and harder to keep them clean, it's sort of a, a you know, balancing act, which one should we do? So to me, the other way we can keep Lake counties, lakes and um, rivers and, you know, Lake Apopka 
and the Green Swamp are both considered sort of headwaters of the Ocklawaha as they come together up in Lake Griffin and go out into Lake, Lake um, into the Ocklawaha River. And we need to be making sure the water that's coming through our lake systems is clean, is nourishing to the plants and the animals and, and to the people who use it. If I'm gonna go swimming in Lake Mineola on certain days, I, I kind of wanna find out what's been happening over the first couple of days before I get down to the beach to go swimming. Um, because sometimes we have some pollution problems and we don't know where they came from. Um, so my, my wish is, and it's not a wish, my desire is that, that we work towards getting not only the chain of lakes continue to be clean and sources that are run off into them, they be agricultural, commercial, the that people somehow, if it, we used to have enforcement of ordinances like further ordinances. Um, I'm not so sure that's a bad idea. Uh, other people would think differently. But if that's what it takes to get people to follow the very well thought out and tested ways of putting fertilizer on your lawn or your plants, I think it's, it's the possibility that should be discussed. And the other is that Lake County is no longer a little country county with a few small towns and cities where septic tanks weren't, they were basically the way we did things. We now have over 380,000 plus people in population in Lake County. And in South Lake County, it's growing even faster. The new census statistics will be out soon. They will be interesting because I think they're gonna be higher than that. If you get close to 400,000, which is coming up on half a million people, you need to be um, developing your cities and towns as the urban areas they have become, not using the country, the, the, the ways that we used to do it because it's convenient, because we've always done it that way, because we don't want to use any more money that could go something else. So I appreciate being able to speak to you all about this. I think that it's something that um, check out the Lake County Water Atlas, check out Orange Counties, go to the Department of Health Environmental Health page, look and see what, look at the fertilizer ordinance, see if people will understand if we can get people to really understand that or the companies that sell fertilizer. And I don't know whether I was in Lowe's the other day, I really don't know if they are selling the low, the slow release fertilizer only, or they're selling anything that's out there. I don't know, because I wasn't looking for fertilizer, but a lot of people were. I think that we need to look at talking to them about helping us keep the lake systems and the, the beautiful water systems we have clean and inviting and something that we can use forever. So, uh, and I think the people moving here expect that, but it's not going to last for long if we don't start taking care of it in some different ways. So um, I'll be happy later to answer any questions, but by all means, check out um, our the different um, information you can give maybe to friends and family about the chain of lakes, both of them and how they function about the new fertilizer ordinance, about how they can get any information they need off of the water atlas, um, and about how they need to speak maybe to their city council, to the county commissioner in their district about what are we going to do in the future about solid waste disposal. We've got to come up with a better solution if we want to keep our environment clean. So on that note, I thank you very much. I thank everyone for putting this together who, who was uh, very instrumental, I think, Val, for all her help. So thank you very much.
Well, well, thanks a lot, Peggy. That was definitely super informative. And I think we've all, in all of these talks today, learned some things that maybe we didn't want to have to think yeah. about too much. Um, but if you want to become an environmental expert, you have to think about septic tanks. There you go. <laughs> and fertilizer, which isn't very pleasant either. So we, we have some great questions in the chat window and I'll go ahead and go through them and um, ask one of our experts to answer them and hopefully we can get some of these things addressed. Uh, so I'll just start from the top again. If you have questions that have come up, everyone watching, please type them in the chat window. We'll get to as many as we can. I will rely on the UU Tech team to let me know yeah. if we need to wrap up and I'll just start going through the questions until then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which might maybe we'll I be have here to until thank, I have to thank my son for his way to go. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first question is that was from um, Sammy Taylor says, how much influence does the restoration of the St. John's River have on the restoration of the Zaklawaha project regarding the re, um, removal of the Rodman Reservoir and the Kirkpatrick oh, Dam? Uh, I'll do a quick screen share here. I want to show you a map that will give you a little more information on that. And in case you didn't pick it up, Peggy didn't explicitly say this, but on everything from the east side of the state of Florida and actually F Flat Island Preserve in Leesburg is the, the um, continental divide of Florida, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the um, Everything on the east side of the state flows north. The water systems right. all push north. Everyone kind of assumes rivers flow south. So you can see in this map, this is the quickest one I could find. It's not great. You can see the St. John's River over here and it starts, I'm not even sure exactly where it starts, way down south here below Lake right, Monroe. Right, way south of that. Where you way are. south of that. Yeah. Okay, so the water is all coming, moving from the south, pushing north, all the way up through here, um, and it goes up and through Putnam County. And so the Ocklawaha River does a very similar thing. It's the water from the Ocklawaha, as Peggy explained, starts in the Green Swamp mostly, and a lot of rainwater, and it pushes north. It, it goes all the way north, up through Marion County until it hits the Rodman Reservoir. So the work in the event there's a lot of work going on in the St. John's River Basin around biosolids and septic waste disposal, getting dumped on the ground and adding nutrients into this system. That's not directly affecting the Aquawaha project because that water doesn't meet up yet, but the processes, the, the processes and the laws and the rules are of course going to affect the entire state if they can get some changes in that. So the, um, but the health of the, the St. John's River is important because the northern part of the St. John's River is where our manatees come in. It's where the fish, the fish migrations occur. And so if this section of the river is healthier, the manatees and the fish are going to come and the dam is gone. The manatees and the fish are going to come into our system and we'll start seeing more manatees and better fish populations over time in our chain of lakes. Now there is another dam over here that's off of Highway 42 and the Moss Bluff Dam and the river is fairly channelized through here. So I don't think we're ever going to see a restoration of this segment of the river and, um, and it, they're still going to have the problem of this dam here in Marion County, but it will over time gradually change as the um, this river gets healthier, then this one will get healthier as well. Um, okay, so the next question is, let me go back up here. You want me to read them? I have them all written down for yeah, you. That, that'd be the great, next, please, Mar please do. Martha asks, does Lake County have aqua blooms? Ah, uh, Marianne. Martha. Okay. So I think that what Martha was asking is, do we have um, toxic um, algal blooms here in Lake County? And um, at any one given time, the answer is yes. We, we do experience toxic algae blooms here. Uh, we do not have red tide here, uh, and we'll never have, uh, at least not until the oceans rise up enough to where we are, waterfront property here in Lake County. Uh, we don't deal with red tide. That's a, a salinity-based organism. But we do have toxic algal blooms here uh, in Lake County. I know a lot of you have, have seen um, algal blooms on Lake uh, Lake Mineola. However, um, all of the data from all of the monitoring that has been done to this point has indicated that um, everything has been below um, health thresholds. And uh, so we're continuing to monitor um, that there as well to make sure that is, but nothing has indicated it's, we've had a need to close 
to advise the city to close the beaches or anything like that at this point. Um, and again, toxic algae blooms can interfere with people with respiratory issues. Um, if the water doesn't look good to you, then don't go near it. Uh, that's the best rule of thumb. And you, because even I will experience some coughing if I have to do some sampling. So yes, we do, but um, on a minimal here and there basis. Jane, Jane Hapting wants to know, are municipalities required to pass a fertilizer ordinance and which ones have done so? Under the um, Protection Act that I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the county passed the ordinance. Uh, however, each of the individual cities also has some semblance of a fertilizer ordinance uh, and not necessarily because they were required to do it because of the um, uh, Aquifer and Springs Protection Act, but because they got benefits, um, credits awarded to them for free, basically, uh, for their in their basin management action plans. Uh, it was to their benefit to have a fertilizer ordinance. What we're doing now is working with those individual cities to beef up those ordinances to increase the fertilizer free zones. A lot of them maybe only have 10 foot of no maintenance and no fertilizer on the shoreline. We'd like to see that from 15 to 30 feet or more. So we're working with the cities to improve that. And Martha Harnett wants to know what about septic contamination of the waterways? Well, that can happen. Um, and it has happened. Um, and uh, there is a problem over on the St. John's now, apparently with um, some septic systems that were just uh, too close to the river and uh, never, never uh, maintained. And so eventually their runoff made it into the river water. Uh, it does happen. Um, there are there are rules and when if you go to the department of health to look up the different requirements for getting a permit now of course if no one gets a permit no one knows about it that's a different story but if you're getting a permit and all all reputable builders and people and the realtors all do that a permit has certain requirements you must meet of being so far away from this 75 feet away from this that's why it's very difficult in some of these subdivisions i don't know how sometimes they get them in there, but they do because um, then they have so much open space. But there are very strict rules about how far away from a natural water body or uh, something, a uh, stormwater system that you have to put a drain field. So it's, it's, it's not a very common experience, but it, it has been known to happen occasionally. All right, David Trump wants to ask Peggy, um, he says, I know Lake Apopka was essentially a dead lake full of toxins at one time. What is its status today? Well, I hate to say this to you, but I'm not exactly sure. It is improved. It is improved like greatly. That up? Yeah, you can, it is improved greatly. Um, but the lake itself, it is improved downstream as you go through the nutrient reduction facility into Lake Beauclair, which is cleaning up the Harris chain of lakes and is and has made a bigger difference, a, a big difference in the last 10 years. And the lake yeah, itself. Yeah, and is, the over, it, in Lake Apopka itself, the St. John's River Water Management District oversees the restoration of Lake Apopka. And there are um, several different agencies who have all been involved in certain parts of this. One of the things that they've done is install a marsh flowway, which basically takes our cues from nature and uses wetlands to cycle the water back through these uh, low-lying wetland areas, pushing it through, allowing the pollution to settle out, and then that cleaner, clearer water flushes back out into the lake. And, and flying overhead, you can physically see clear plumes of water coming out. However, it takes three years to cycle the entire volume of Lake Apopka through the marsh flowway just one time. So it, that's a long-term process. The other thing that they have been doing is they have been doing commercial shad fishing. So they're removing gizzard shad because those are, um, those are rough fish 
and they are uh, little pollution recyclers. As they're eating on the bottom, they stir up the pollution uh, from the bottom and send it back up into the water column. And their bodies also absorb phosphorus. So every time they excrete, uh, they flush that pollution back out again. So the district is, is um, having commercial fishermen remove the uh, solely the rough fish, not any sport fish. Uh, fish and Wildlife and the Water Management District have also been planting um, several hundred acres of uh, shoreline vegetation again. So the eelgrass beds are taking off. Um, they're also reflooding certain areas. So improvements are happening along the way and uh, things are, are getting a lot better. Um, I personally wouldn't swim in it, but that's only because I have seen the size of the alligators there. Another good point. Christy, are you there? Oh, and I did see a question from um, he was asking about um, uh, if sea level rise was going to impact um, septic tanks. And yes, uh, most definitely, absolutely. And I think this is also something where uh, Beverly's climate justice comes into play is that, um, you know, I probably would be able to come up with the money it would take to connect onto septic system. But people um, in um, disadvantaged areas are not going to be able to come up with that funds. And none of us should have to. This should be a quite funded thing where everybody gets off of septic and gets onto a monitored sewer system. No questions asked. Okay, Sammy Taylor wants someone to explain why sand mines were granted access to dredge the green swamp and why their leases are renewed and how can we stop the destruction of the green swamp? Oh, that's a whole other meeting. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. Um, how much time the, do you have? It, it started years ago and it has progressed. And when the comp plan was sort of revised a few years ago, the county managed to change the open space requirement for mining or for in the green swamp and the mining industry didn't catch it. So when they did get, um, so to say, caught, um, personally speaking, and I have, um, there was a great article uh, in the paper for um, Craig, it was Craig Pittman's uh, article about this, which was in Phoenix or Florida. And he had a comment from Charles Lee, who is vice president of Audubon of Florida. And um, Lee is quoted in here as saying, wipe out the green swamp uplands and turn them into sand barrel pits, sand borrow pits and you will have altered the basic hydrology of the green swamp big time. Now I know Charles, he's been with Audubon for 35 years at least. He knows what he's talking about. If you wipe out the uplands, you're gonna change the hydrology of the green swamp. And there is now more than there ever used to be, um, uh, they have bought and gotten permits to do it. So are they going to destroy it? No. Are they going to have to change the way they do things? Yes. And I don't know how um, this is going to turn out. Stay tuned. Um, show up at the July County Commission meeting and, and talk about it. There are, there are a lot of facts, a lot of pieces to this puzzle. It's just Marianne, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Oh, she's muted herself. All right. Well, yeah, I was just going to mention that um, at the March Water Authority Board meeting, their Board of Trustees passed a resolution opposing changes to the county comp plan to allow um, additional sand mining in the Green Swamp area of state critical concern. Yes, they they passed a resolution, which I was glad to see that they're on 
our side now about it's, you, if you harm the green swamp and affect the Florida aquifer to a point where it cannot recover even that little piece, it's just like a big puzzle. And the more little pieces that you cause a problem to that cannot be fixed, the less you're going to have downstream, so to speak. So we'll see. July should be an interesting meeting. Please come. Yeah. Um, Lucille asked where she could get the fertilizer handouts, and Marianne did put a link in the chat box. So if you, she wants to give fertilizer handouts to her neighbors. So yeah, and you know, and um, I was looking online for. Let me see if I can get that. We have also have a brochure that the that the county and the water authority had put together. Um, I couldn't find it on the county's website. Um, but they at least do have the PDF there. But if you um, contact us at the Water Authority, Lucy, we'd be happy to um, put a handful of them together for you so that you can hand them out in your neighborhood. Perfect. And um, Jane Hepting wants to know, is it true hydrogen peroxide pellets were dumped into Lake Mineola recently? Yes, that is part of the St. John's River Water Management District's um, pilot program with a company, I think they're called Blue Green Water, um, something along those lines. And you actually can, um, can sign up um, on with the Water Management District and they will send you notifications when those treatments are occurring. They just did one on April 7th. And what happens is, is that it's uh, these pellets, the hydrogen peroxide pellets that they put out are coated um, with the surfactant that helps them stay at the surface as opposed to sinking down. So they're at the surface where algal blooms can occur and they will help to um, keep the algae from causing a bloom. Um, I don't know how long or um, I think the total cost of that project was $1.7 million that um, St. John's is paying through a grant from the state legislature. What is going to happen when that money runs out? I don't know. But if Claremont, Mineola, and Groveland have a couple million dollars in their budget, they could keep treating the lake to prevent those, or we could just stop putting fertilizer on our lawns, and then we don't have to pay the $1.7 million a year to stop. There you the go. <laughs> Fix it before. It and where can people get the sewage septic maps? Is there a website, or can they get those from the Water Authority? What did she ask? The um, Department of Health, I think. Ha yeah. Yes, the Department of Health has when you go to either the state or the Lake County uh, site, you go to the Department of Health, you click on environmental health, and they have every kind of question you have about that and permits, getting permits, not getting permits, anything you need to know is on the Department of Health environment and it's under environmental health on their website. Okay. You have to get past the COVID stuff first, but after you do that, you're in good shape. <laughs> I, I, I'm actually is to add on to Peggy's talk a little bit too. I wanted to point out this really important thing that I didn't realize until recently is that even the best perfectly functioning brand new standard septic system does not take out the nitrogen and phosphorus from the wastewater. Mm -hmm. The water that drips out through the drain field goes into your soil and the, those, the phosphorus and nitrogen go directly into the aquifer. And the, the graphic that Peggy had that showed the septic tank and then the supplemental tank that is one thing that the county is considering is requiring new septic systems, or it's been, I shouldn't say the county is considering that might exaggerate a little bit. It's something that's an idea that's floating around out there in the environmental world that we should require if new septic tanks have the supplemental um, treatment tank on it to remove the nitrogen and phosphorus. Right. So yeah, even if you think, oh, we've got to pump it, we've got to make sure it's working correctly, you got to make sure it's away from the well, it's still putting the nitrogen and phosphorus into the environment. That's how they're designed to work is they get rid of the solid waste. So everyone thinks about the poo. They don't realize that the poo and the, the bacteria is getting taken care of by the tank, but the additional treatment is one that's going to get rid of the nitrogen and phosphorus. Yeah. Okay. Yes, because that goes, yeah. Constance has her hand up. So if you can unmute Constance. 
and ask your question. I don't think so. I didn't mean to put my hand up. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, Diana wants to know where to get slow release fertilizer. She's been having problems getting it. Somebody said they got it at Yard Stop, but she wants to know what companies make it, and how to get it. Oh, I can address that a little bit. I don't know where to get it because I don't ever buy fertilizer, but I attached a document, a PDF in the chat window. Um, it's from 2017, but Seminole County, when they did their fertilizer ordinance, they actually published a list of fertilizers that you can use. And so I attached that in the chat window. That's a good reference for you. Um, Marianne, maybe you'll have some more specifics too. Yeah, I'm with you, Susan. I don't buy it, so um, but I am go I am going to Lowe's to check out the sad plant rack this week. Um, I'm a plant rescuer, and um, I will look in their fertilizer section and see what they got because um, the and here's how it works, folks. If you the oh, they're maniacal nitrogen. Yeah, they're going to ask you to, uh, they, they, the big box stores, they'll sell you what you want. So if everybody goes to the store and asks for um, this particular type of fertilizer, this is how it all started way back when our friend Linda Bystrack was still down here. We kept bugging them, please don't sell us fertilizer with phosphorus in it. We mine phosphorus in the state of Florida and we ship it around the world. We have plenty here. Never buy a fertilizer with a number um, with phosphorus in it. Don't waste your money. So um, just be a little bit more conscious. And you know what? I'll bet you your lawn will do just fine without you anyway. So save your money for something else. Okay. Uh, excuse um, me, I don't want it for the lawn. I want it for my flower, flowering shrubs. <laughs> oh yeah. Now um, with individual, um, uh, Specific, a lot of times they need micronutrients. So you would not have to, uh, the slow release, you, if you're not doing a broadcast type um, fertilization, then you can go ahead and, you know, if you're going to fertilize your rose bed or your azalea bed, you want something that's specific for those type of uh, plants. If you're just looking for your, um, like bloom boosters, that sort of thing. I'm just telling you, it's extremely difficult to find quality fertilizer. That's for yeah. sure. That's for sure. I, Diana, I emailed you the list that is in the chat window. Okay. And Martha wants to know what about attempting planning commission, about the attempted planning commission for water protections for the Green Swamp, Sumter, Polk, and Lake counties, and, and another county. I'm sorry, what the planning, what about a planning commission or is there one? I didn't quite understand what she. There was a commission, but it has been unsuccessful. Um, and I don't know if it's been disbanded or they have been told to get a move on or they just aren't working together versus the South. The example was Southwest Water Management. And, well, I can't, uh, I, I can't, the only commission that we used it, and it's almost 30 years old, was the, the Green Swamp um, Task Force Committee, which um, was, and the Green Swamp Land Acquisition Committee, which had, was in the, um, or, well, at least around the year 2000, maybe a little before that, and it was wiped uh off the map by uh, one legislator's uh, bill she put into the, and so that was the end of that. And we haven't had a multi-county group that I know of since then. Although people who live in like the Ryans or me or some other folks who live in different parts of the Green Swamp do kind of you know keep each other apprised of stuff that's going on. But I don't know if there's a new one coming about, that would be wonderful because I think they need to coordinate their efforts and all sort of be on the same page. It would help. But I haven't heard of one. Thank you. Uh, I don't see too many other questions. Are there more questions, Christy? Um, just, just one, are people on septic systems also on well systems? Well, they are sometimes. If you live in the country um, on a small farm, um, you usually have a well. 
uh, let's face it, septic tanks are almost necessary in rural areas. When I say rural, I don't mean one house per acre. I mean rural. I mean where people, um, where I've lived more than half my life, and they all have, you have your own well, because it just doesn't work to have a well every acre, because you can hit and uh, you can have you have more room for a bigger step. So yes, you have to uh, you have your own well and you have your own septic tank. And part of that has to do with you have to remember. And I can remember when I sold my house in the Green Swamp, more I, the lack of information were people who said, "What's that little house over there to the side?" And I said, "Oh, that's the pump house." She said, "What do you pump?" I said, "Water." <laughs> Thinking exactly. <laughs> And that the cost of running infrastructure for um, central water or central sewer out into the countryside where you've got 10 acres between houses, it's just not feasible. Cities and counties are not going to do that. So yes, you have to, if you buy, you know, you do have a well usually when you have a septic tank but they're separated and there are rules about how far each has to be from the other, who can be uphill, who can be downhill, et cetera. So that's all taken care of. Since we had so many questions in the chat box, I'm not sure we have time for any more from the, uh, from the gallery. Christy, did we exhaust all the questions from the chat box? Um, pretty much, let's see if there's, oh, somebody, oh. Marianne says, for everyone, anyone who would like to have a presentation on our water resources for your civic group, you can contact her and she's got her email address in there or her, yeah. And um, I, guess, I guess that is it. And remember, you can watch this on the UUCLC um, YouTube channel which is on our website. You can click, get the link for that. So this will be available soon on our, on our YouTube channel. Um, I'd like to thank everyone with the Unitarian Church and, and for putting this together and, and giving us this opportunity <laughs> to talk. And for the, the 50 people in the chat room now, for all of them too, I'm glad to, and if you have questions that relate to something Marianne can answer or uh, something I can answer. I'm sure um, Jane Hepting or someone else at uh, Uni Unitarian Church has our email addresses if you need that. So thank, thank you, very you very much. much. And I'd like to turn it over to Russ Littlefield to close out our session tonight. Thank you, Henry. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to uh, thank everyone who participated again and thank all of our speakers. It's really been a, an, an extraordinary evening, I think. Tuning in against next month when we will have the second of our series on the environment, um, it will be called Managing Growth. And Igor Emery will lead a forum of presenters from County Commissioner Doug Shields, naturalist Levon Silvernell, and the comprehensive plan author, Rob Kelly. That should also be a winner. Until then, as I extinguish our chalice, let us hear the words of Father Thomas Berry, who said, the natural world is the larger sacred community to which we belong. To be alienated from this community is to become destitute in all that makes us humid. To damage this community is to diminish our existence. Thank you again and good night.